Ed, um, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon session. My name is Christina van der I'm from the University of Adelaide, and I'm really pleased to chair this session. And I'd like to introduce the first uh, speaker, Gregor Grady from uh, the University of Auckland, uh, talking uh, from electrogastrography to gastric electrical body surface mapping. Go ahead. Thank you. It's great to be here. I have some disclosures, including being a co-founder of Elimetry, which I'm going to talk about. So chronic gastric symptoms are obviously extremely common. About a third of our patients in some of our clinics have these sort of symptoms. But it's fair to say, I think, that we all agree we've reached a bit of an impasse in how to approach um, correct diagnosis and management. Of course, the only widely available test has been gastric emptying. And I think this study from Pasri Kuradel really clarified where we're at with gastric emptying to me. It was a real clarifying moment. Um, showed the weaknesses of the study really clearly. It lacks reproducibility, highly labile. More than 40% of patients changed greater category at 48 weeks. It did not correlate with symptoms. And most importantly for this talk, it doesn't correlate with neuromuscular pathologies. We know that about a third or 40% of patients who come through with um, chronic nausea and vomiting have a neuromuscular pathology in the stomach objectively on histopathology. And whether you had delayed gastric emptying or not um, didn't, you know, didn't determine whether you were in the group with this neuromuscular pathology in the study. I personally still think it's maybe a useful test when it's delayed, but if it's not delayed, I tend to ignore it. And I don't think this should be a surprise to us, of course, because we all know the stomach's complicated, and that transit itself is an integrated or higher order function of the stomach that depends on multiple other things. You have to have correct accommodation, you have to have correct trituration, you have to have correct pyloric function, and the pressure gradient's also important between the stomach and duodenum, and all the feedback that's going on. So a very higher order function, and uh, alone is never gonna be enough. So I think at this point, maybe we've reached peak confusion in the field. I don't think we even know what to call these disorders anymore, which shows we've still got a lot to learn. Are they neuromuscular disorders, Is it disease spectrum? Are they DGBIs? Is it just sometimes a DG? And then what's the role of motility at this point? And I think I'm preaching to the choir at this meeting that I think the future is going to be getting to the underlying mechanisms of what's going on in any individual patient instead of treating these patients as all the same. All gastroparesis patients are not the same nor a functional dyspepsia patients. And the sooner I think we can get to the heart of the matter, like the rest of medicine has done, drill down into mechanisms and find biomarkers and treat, the sooner we'll be doing better. And we know great work done in all of the areas shown on the slide has shown that they're important in some patients. We've been very focused on this part of the stomach, the electrical apparatus, the conduction system, which drives, of course, the contractions. And we've been working on this for a number of while, a number of years, trying to develop a correct test to get at this very important part of stomach physiology. And of course, this goes back to Alvarez, now 100 years old, his little prophecy, he called it in the JAMA paper, that gastroenterologists would come to rely upon these measures just as the heart specialist does. And I think we're gonna get there. So this is our legacy test, no longer widely practiced and largely abandoned. Um, really went deep into understanding what was wrong with this test. And I think the three key things that we came out with were that it wasn't over the stomach a lot of the time. These signals are really weak. They're 100 times weaker than the heart, and to get at them is difficult. You've got to be right on the stomach or the signal fades, and stomach variability is, is really significant. It's really bad at discriminating signal from noise, unless you're right over it and get lucky. And then it's got suboptimal biomarkers. The things that were looked at were probably actually wrong. We, when we started this, went right back to basics and tried to get ground truth data, okay, what's the stomach actually doing? And developed these electrodes, mapped invasively a lot of people. This is very normal uh, waves going down the stomach here on the stomach, beautiful um, six centimeters apart every 20 seconds like clockwork, that's the way it should be. And then we mapped patients with nausea and vomiting syndromes, um, gastroparesis, and showed a range of abnormalities. This is all old work, retrograde activities, or sometimes, these waves start out normal and then you'll see they become very haphazard and disorganized. So we developed kind of a database of what the stomach could do, what its ranges were, what, was, um, what could possibly go wrong, at least in terms of the conduction apparatus. We also did full thickness biopsies on these same patients and showed that again, a group of them have neuromuscular pathologies in the stomach, regardless of whether the gastric emptying is delayed or normal. So we can correlate these abnormalities we see on the physiology with ICC loss. It's a subgroup of patients. 
course, this is slightly too invasive for clinical use. So we went about um, trying to make a new clinical tool. On this slide is listed all the things that we came up with that we wanted to improve. And it's not about any one thing, it's about all of them. All of them are very important. And so we've chipped away at each of the items on this slide gradually in order to, to hopefully build a better version of this test that can be clinically useful. I'll show you where we're up to. This is where we started uh, three or four years ago. It's kind of um, spaghetti of wires, Frankenstein's chew box. Took a couple of hours to set up. But we wanted to get, again, just as much data as we possibly could to know what we could go back to. Then my colleague Armin, who's really spearheading a lot of the technical work, did this really good paper in 2019 where he localized the stomach by CT. So he knew exactly where it was and showed if you're right on top of it with a large number of electrodes and you smate those electrodes together, not just use one or two of them, but you bring them all out, then you could start to get useful data. And this graph for us was a crystallizing moment where he showed that the percentage of slow waves that are propagating abnormally had a symptom correlation. And as, as we all know in this field, symptom correlations are uh, difficult. And so this was um, a really nice moment where we thought, well, let's go after this and try and build a clinical tool. So we got our heads together, arm and moved to New Zealand, and we um, went for it. We came up with this array, which was a real technical breakthrough because um, sticking all those electrodes on was not much fun. And we did this through screen printing, and then you kind of convert it. It's very complicated. You need a big machine, and you stick all the hydrogels on and the adhesive and then the arrays. But this has been the, the breakthrough technology that's allowed us to do this test efficiently so you don't have to sit there for hours prepping the patient. And then we built the device, and this was a nice little pandemic project where we kind of sat down and bunkered away for a couple of years to work out the perfect reader. This is called a reader device, so that you didn't need all those wires. And so connecting a flexible substrate to a rigid circuit board is not easy, and we came up with this clip design. It's all designed around the clips to really clamp down on that electrode in order to transfer the signals. And then we built an iPad app to control it, and so that you can do it all pretty efficiently without any basically a wearable device. It's large, but it's wearable. And it's pretty easy to set up. It takes about five to 10 minutes. We still measure some landmarks before we put it on because getting it in just the right place adds to that improvement. And then the patient sits in a chair and reclined slightly. That's critical as well for the test. We developed a symptom logging app, and this is equally important to the physiological measurement. They can't be separated in terms of their importance. We designed it so that patients log their symptoms every 15 minutes on this dashboard, and um, we separated events like reflux and vomiting from continuous symptoms like pain and nausea. And we developed a standardized protocol, which we went for four and a half hours, again, from our principle of starting with the gold standard, everything we can possibly get information-wise, and later we'll cut it back. But at the moment, we do a four and a half hour test based on um, how long it takes the stomach to process a meal. So 30 minutes fasting, and we did an off-the-shelf off the cheap meal of a Cliff Bar and an Enchil drink, and then four hours of recordings when the patient's logging every 15 minutes their symptoms. We make this report that goes through the cloud and then comes back to the patient. It's currently three pages. It's a work in continuous evolution, and it's um, continuously improving probably for the next, I don't know how long Chicago's been going, but it'll continue to do the same, I'm sure. So it's got the first page here, which is um, the physiology, and then the second page is the symptoms, and the last page is a technical page with motion artifacts and signal quality. So I'll run, run you through some of these items. So this is the spectral analysis. It's the key bit of the physiology. And you see here, this is the frequency on one side and the amplitude here in the spectrum. And you've got the amplitude graph as well, and then the symptom burden at the bottom. And we see over time here, here's fasting, this is the meal, and then the stomach kicks in, contracts, and the amplitude goes up, and then it goes back to baseline. And this is a really normal study here. And we see over here um, these metrics. We look at the frequency, the amplitude, which we have to adjust for BMI because it has a dramatic effect on the BMI. And this thing called the rhythm index, where we threw away tachygastria and bradygastria and separated rhythm from frequency. And that was a very important moment um, in the work sounds trivial, but it was actually really hard to work out, that we brought rhythm out from frequency because they're very different, and that tells us a lot of new information about the stomach when we did that. And then we get a ratio of fed to fasted as well. We did a reference range for these four values in 110 people, and this is just in press at the moment. I think a really interesting point here was that the frequency range of the human stomach, I don't know if anyone's done old school EGG work, is actually really tight. It sits in this band like sits there, and it um, really doesn't go outside that band very often. Um, 
And so all the old data on bradygastria and tachygastria was way overestimated. It's like locked in that band. Um, amplitude range is BMI adjusted again, and we BMI adjust the rhythm index as well because that has an effect. So then we started doing patients, and the first thing that really jumped out was this phenotype. And again, you know, we started to see it in maybe 30% of patients with chronic nausea and vomiting or who had been diagnosed with gastroparesis. And I just want you to compare visually this plot versus this one. Nice stable line here where the stomach's locked in, and this one it's jumping all over the place. And we never see this in controls unless you miss the stomach, which our array is so big it doesn't. Um, but this is a pathological stomach where these um, frequencies waves are all over the place. We define this with a rhythm index, and if it's less than 0.25, it's abnormal. This patient's abnormal for the whole time period. And this is what the symptom page looks like. Uh, this is fasting, here's the meal, and then it kicks in and we get these graphs of nausea, bloating, pain that the patient's logging every 15 minutes. And you can see this patient has meal responsive symptoms that are pretty continuous. So what do we think is going on? We think in these um, highly irregular ones, it's just reflecting a summation of lots of discoordinated activity in the stomach. These are the pathological stomachs, we believe. We'd love to get invasive data on these patients to compare, but of course, getting full thickness biopsies is no easy task. So this is, um, you know, one plus one equals two type of work. We think there's a neuromuscular problem. We've got good reasons to believe that. And uh, this is the phenotype we're calling neuromuscular. We did a study of these published last year. Um, and we did 43 controls and equal number of patients and found about a third of them have this phenotype. And two thirds don't. They have completely normal looking stomachs. Interestingly, the ones with the normal stomachs had way higher rates of anxiety and depression. And those with abnormal stomachs really didn't have anxiety and depression in the study. So we had this really clean, this is quite a complex plot, but for the purposes of this talk, in purple, these are health psychology, depression, anxiety, and these are all the symptoms. And you see this really strong correlation between health psychology and symptoms in the group with the normal tests. And over here we have our metrics in orange correlating really strongly in those with abnormal tests, but health psychology did not correlate. So we're just really splitting these two groups out that we think signify two different subgroups in these disorders. So where are we at? What we're trying to do is, because we're enamored with the Chicago work, is build a phenotype system systematically on these patients. And the first one you've seen is this one, which is a spectral phenotype, meaning it comes from the frequency graph. And it's a neuromuscular profile, we believe. This is now based on about 2,000 cases, maybe 1,000 clinical and other research things. So we've got a significant weight behind it that we're adding to. And I'll show you a few of the other phenotypes that we're working on. A few patients do have high frequencies. And this is not common at all. And interestingly, we're I'd say almost always, or very commonly seeing it in vagal problems. We think of vagal problems. Vagal injuries pop out. They have very high frequencies and often these meal responsive symptoms with this patient's got vomiting, reflux, nausea. Um, you can see the symptom burden here tracks up after the meal and this patient's clocking at four, which with the stomach is about what it can do. It can't get much higher than that. We also see it in long-term diabetics the other group, you can look at a graph and if they've got a high frequency, the first question I always ask is, is a diabetic? Because that's almost uh, the most common case for sure. <coughs> and this is even not that dramatic. It's about 3.8. This is really high for the stomach. Just doesn't do this normally very often, at least not for long time periods. Interestingly, this is a study that's currently um, coming through where there's a symptom correlation again um, between the principal frequency deviation, how far away it was from normal and the GCSI and these long-term diabetics. So the ones with higher frequencies, more symptoms, we think it's a vagal neuropathy and the symptoms are probably coming from that vagal neuropathy and correlated with change. I don't understand why the, we know that ICCs are innovated, but we don't really understand that it must be constantly suppressing the frequency for some reason, vagal innovation. So this is kind of a new thing. It's not in the literature. You see some patients with both diabetics sometimes, like this one, very high frequency and very poor rhythm index. The next phenotype is high amplitudes, and this again is uncommon, but we see a sustained high amplitude sometimes that just rolls on for hours. We have a suspicion based on work by Ken Koch with old EGG that this could be a gastric outlet resistance, but I've got to say that the few patients who have gone on to do pyloric interventions have been pretty variable, so we need to get more data on whether that's actually true and um, do endoflip and other things and see what happens. So here we go, here's our spectral phenotypes. There's three main ones. You can also get a low frequency, almost always only after surgery, cut out the pacemaker with a sleeve. You can also get a low amplitude, which may be um, like a hypermotility state. 
Those are the most common ones. Now, the second layer, lastly, is uh, the symptom data, which is equally important, as I said. And we're kind of layering these on through the test and trying to get them together. So here are the three most common symptom profiles. So on, on the one on the left here, what you see here are meal responsive symptoms. The patient's had a meal, and then they've got these really nice decay curves. And from work from Jan Tack's group and others, we know that this correlates with gastric emptying, these curves, as you'd expect. This is a gastric symptom profile to us. We're doing correlated studies with gastric emptying at the moment to prove that, but it's a pretty strong suspicion. So this patient's symptoms are probably coming from the stomach. If you compare it with this one, here's the meal. These symptoms are rocking on all the time, nausea, bloating, pain, excessive fullness, no relationship to the meal, really, that's continuous. This one's a delayed. This is a patient from last week who has had a G poem, actually, diabetic, and their symptoms are coming on late, and we think these are post-gastric. They're coming <laughs> from the small bowel. If you went over eight hours, it might actually be another curve that curves back down like this, like this one, over a more extended time course like the small bowel. You can now put these together so that you get the correlation. So this patient here um, has this abnormality. There's a little transient abnormality in the test here. This is a sensory motor profile, what we're calling. They correlate with gastric activity. When the stomach's working, the symptoms are there. Like I've injured my knee at the moment. When I walk, it's sore. What these patients have sore stomachs. That's what simplistically we're saying. Versus these continuous ones where the symptoms have no relationship at all to what the stomach's doing. The stomach's working, it's not working, the symptoms are there. And then these post-gastric ones which often come on after the stomach's finished its thing to return to baseline and then the symptoms are kicking in. So here's our little uh, merging classification scheme from our clinical user group. Neuromuscular high frequency amplitudes and then these three profiles. We're getting quite good symptom correlations with them at the moment, which is promising. We're about to um, do a paper on that. And I'm getting confidence in these. They're really feeling like we're locking in a few different profiles of the stomach. The next question is, are they clinically useful? I don't have time to talk about that, but we do have this work in progress where we're putting together a treatment guideline. We're trying to get it. How do we lock these into treatments? Um, I'm going to leave, if you're interested in this, you can get it from me later, or I'll leave a couple of books up at the back. If you're very interested, you can pick them up. So we're inviting people to participate in this um, as well. We're um, going to bring it to the gastric group here. It's an exciting meeting yesterday and others, so um, happy to have any questions. So Thank you very much, Greg, for this very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Jutta? Uh, if I've understood correctly, you said that it's important to differentiate rhythm from frequency. What does this mean? Yeah, yeah, so this is uh, slightly technical, but what we do is, if you look at one of these graphs, for the frequency, we, we look in that normal range of the stomach and then we do a principal gastric frequency over a time period, we average the frequency. And then for the rhythm, we look at how much of the power of this, this is within this normal band versus scattered in other bands of the stomach. So it does a different calculation. And when it's really scattered, we don't report the frequency at all. We just report the rhythm because to get the rhythm, we have to lock in on it over a period of time. The algorithm locks in on it to lock it out. Yeah. And maybe a comment to your high frequency uh, vagal faction patients. The vagus does suppress phase three activity, for instance. So the, uh, this might play a role because there's no, not such a good transmission of the the uh, uh, MMC, uh, the the ICC activity to actually contraction if the vagus is active, and if it's inactive, it's there's a better transmission actually. Right. So okay. that might be one answer. It suppresses half frequency too. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Greg, can I ask you something as well? In relation to the meal, I guess the entry, that's sort of a, a mixed nutrient drink, yeah, not yeah. super high in fat, for example. Yeah. Have you got any any data or any thoughts yeah. in terms of what might happen? Because, you know, we know that patients, resp I mean, fat is something that everyone gets symptoms from. Yeah, we debated um, the meal. There's some fat in the bar. It's a cliff bar. It's got fat in it. And yeah. We have both. And we debated the meal. You can't, you know, we chose a big one that would stimulate symptoms just because we wanted to get symptoms out. And yes. if we stimulate symptoms, we're going to so, get... So what's the, what's the volume? It's about 480 calories. Right. Calories okay. And the volume? Yeah. Uh, 250 mils of inshore and a cliff bar is 
you know. Okay, not not super high yeah. in volume, yeah. Uh, but yeah. We're testing at the moment a range of different meals. Yeah. The bar alone, the drink alone, pancakes, all sorts of things. The range of effects on the reference range is not dramatic, uh, right. but the range of time that the stomach works for shrinks. So you have to kind of, you know, maybe in future we can give a short, a smaller meal and measure for a shorter time, but we want confidence that we're pulling out pathology first. Mm. But could you, if you give a more specific, I mean, I, as you probably know, I've been interested in sort of fat and dyspeptic symptoms, etc. If you would give a high fat, it doesn't have to be a high volume meal, um, do you think you could, you know, induce particular symptoms as opposed to a, a broader yeah, range? Be, and be, what would, ha how would that um, relate to... It would be really easy to study, but we've never done it. So okay, it's a really yeah, good yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can look at it. Craig, very, very nice work. In, your, in the work that you did recording directly from the surface of the stomach, you also had focused on propagation, uh, yeah. right? And, and yeah. you had uncovered several abnormalities. Um, this is predominantly focused on frequency and rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, but because you have so many electrodes, do you glean any information on propagation? Yeah, we, we do. Um, I'd call it work in progress. So. My, my view is it will add another 10 to 15% of patients will pick something out, particularly functional dyspepsia seems to be, and it's very hard to get it dialed in enough for clinical uh, regulatory clearance, but we're getting there, probably another year away. And what, it, what we're seeing is, um, in particular, the waves can go backwards in the stomach, and we think it's a hypomotility state, we don't know for sure, but. I did, maybe I didn't get it, what do you really measure? What do you really measure? Yeah, it's electrophysiology, myo myoelectrical activity. activity. Yeah, a combination so of the ICC and smooth It's muscle. a sophisticated EGG. This, it, is the high this is the high resolution EGG, basically, this part of it. And then the mapping, the spatial mapping is going to be layered on top later. Can you assess gastric motor activity in this test? Well, if Actual you see, motor activity, yeah. receptive relaxation, gastric accommodation, any other extra information? We don't think so at the moment. There may be a phenotype that comes out with profiles, but at the moment, no, we can't measure accommodation. We're focused on that neuromuscular apparatus. Just to push Last a comment. tiny bit, um, so you believe that these, this band of frequency, this is actually, however, correlating to, mo mo to contractions? Yes. Presumably. Yes. yes. We, I mean, we, you know, it's hard to do them at the same time, but yeah. every time we see a meal response, it kicks in. We know that that's... No, it must be. Yeah, yeah it, it must be. And I, I'm, I'm really relieved you've got rid of tachy and bradycardia because I couldn't work out how that could <laughs> yeah. actually be. And having a reference range was very helpful. We have to continue with the next talk. We have to, we have to continue, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Come up here. You can catch me afterwards. One more. Yeah. Okay, last question. Right. Very short. <laughs> Did you have a chance in your database to monitor patients before and after gastric electric electrical stimulation using this particular device? We've only got a very small number of patients, like three. And if you want to do it, then uh, please, because <laughs> a lot of people ask us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much again, Greg, for a very interesting talk. Our next speaker is John Clark from Stanford, uh, talking about smart pill and other indigestible sensors, technology seeking an indication. The electron, don't worry, the ele it's here. Look. <laughs> There's something super weird going on with my electronics today, but it's all manageable. Oh, good, <laughs> excellent. Well, thanks. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, thanks very much. Uh, disclosure is listed here. And what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is to talk about the current motility capsules which are out, um, give views of the pros and cons of the current landscape, and then to uh, uh, speculate on uh, what the future may hold. And if we look at the current landscape, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about smart pill. Um, but I am going to talk about video capsule endoscopy, uh, about the new gas capsule system, as well as the intestinal sa um, um, uh, uh, sampling device as well. And so to start off first talking about the wireless um, 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 
capsule smart pill. This was FDA approved in 2006, and it's uh, 26 by 13 millimeters, approximately the same size as a large vitamin. It uh, looks at temperature with a range of 25 to 49, pH with a range of 0.5 to 9, then pressure with a range of, of uh, 0 to 350. It um, sends recordings to an external uh, uh, re recorder and does so for approximately five days. And it's been well studied. There's been over um, 200 uh, papers to, to date, though to be fair, a lot of them have been um, clinical trials which have used this as a, mostly a secondary endpoint um, versus review articles which have mentioned it. And this is what you see with the study, where if you um, take a look at temperature, this is essentially the green line here. And what you're seeing is that uh, when the capsule enters the stomach, the pH, or sorry, sorry, the, the um, temperature is blue, which, which you really can't see, but it's at the top of the screen. And that signifies with the, um, um, yeah, so right there, the capsule swallowed, and then at the end it exits. And it's helpful as well because if there's any meal in the first six hours, which is not supposed to happen, then at that point the temperature drops as well. Now what we tend to look at mostly is the pH, which is green. And so what you um, see here is that when the stomach is uh, there, essentially the pH drops and you see that, that, that low point. And then uh, once the capsule enters the small bowel, you see the sharp rise with a pH of three or higher. And then inside the small bowel itself, you see a gradual increase. And once the IC valve is reached, you have a drop off right, right on the left side a little bit going uh, like about, say right, right here. Um, and um, this has really been the, the main issue that's, um, that's, that's been looked at this and is validated. Um, now, maybe there's some information from the small bowel based upon the slope of the pH curve, um, but that's, that's, that's still an area of controversy. Then from the pressure, there's a fair amount of information, but what's normal is to, to some extent not defined. Um, it, it may be a marker of MMC function, and you, there, there is at least one paper which I'll talk about that, that, that does report that it's possible to see the um, phase three with this. Um, it does allow you to look grossly at hyper and hypo pressure situations, and there is at least some literature that speculates upon um, gastric pressure as well as the SE valve pressure. Um, the, the way this is done is that uh, patients fast throughout the night. They take a, um, a bar, which is a smart bar of, of uh, basically a granola type that has 260 calories, 3% 3, 3 fat. That's taken with uh, 50 cc's of water. They uh, then avoid meals for um, um, six hours, and they can eat and drink anything they want and just record symptoms. And I'm going to go through some of the main papers which um, came out about this. This was the first one in um, 2007, where they had looked at doing gastric scintigraphy with smart pill at the same time. And what they found essentially was that the correlation between the two was 0.73, and that it, it appeared that the uh, four-hour gastric emptying time with scintigraphy correlated with the five-hour gastric emptying time with uh, this, and at least the hypothesis is that what's happening is that you're going from a uh, fed state to a fasted state, and when you enter the fasted state, the MMC complex will start back up again, and when the phase three of that comes through, it pushes it out. So you have approximately an hour delay from um, four hours of gastric emptying versus five hours with smart pill. This was the uh, next one that came out. It was a relatively small, small study, but they looked at uh, wireless motility um, versus both scintigraphy as well as 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 well also as 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 um, as I'm um, doing manometry. And it's interesting because you know what we say is what I, I had just said prior, which is that typically you go from fasting fate from from uh, fed state towards fasting you start the MMC back up and then the capsule M will, will, will pass. But it was interesting in their study, that happened in nine of 14 subjects, but in five of 14, it, it was uh, from contractions with, within the antrum, which were not associated with the MMC. But their conclusion was that in most patients that have this done, that that is typically the exit point. Um, this next one was the uh, first paper that uh, looked at wireless motility versus 
um, SITS markers in terms of uh, looking at lower GI dys dysmotility and constipation. And what they found is that um, correlation be between the two was 0.74 at day two, 0.69 at day five. And then if you looked at the specificity of uh, smart pill with constipation specifically, it was pretty good at 0.95. Um, this was the one that, that really tried to put pressure recordings on. And, and if you look at the, the main papers that I've talked about so far, the main focus has really been pH as well as, um, as pretty much the transit throughout. And there's a uh, fair amount of information that we get from the pressure itself. And so this study um, looked at pressure recordings in uh, patients that were uh, diabetic um, as, as well as those who had gastroparesis that was non non-diabetic um, versus controls. And what they found is that in diabetics who had gastroparesis that you could see a difference within the motility um, both prior to gastric emptying as well as just after gastric emptying. And that difference contrasted with the idiopathics as well as with healthy controls. Then finally, this was the second um, one that came out that looked at the wireless motility capsule versus the anteroduodenal manometry. And what, what this one looked at was they looked at whether the wireless motility capsule could really pick up the MMC. Um, and what they found is that um, if you looked at the wireless, um, you could pick up the MMC complexes in, in about 86% of cases, but you couldn't detect um, any propagation with it, which makes sense because the capsule is getting push, pushed with time. It's not fixed in, 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 in a one, one a spot. Um, but what they, they did conclude, which I, I think was interesting from a take-home clinical standpoint, is that there is a high um, negative predictive with it. So if you don't see um, any contractions in that area, you, you can be pretty sure that you're not seeing at that point the MMC. So based on this, um, the ASNM as well as the um, ENMS, uh, both both approved uh, wireless motility capsule as being one of the, the tests which is endorsed to um, look at the upper GI symptoms in uh, those patients with suspected gastroparesis. In uh, patients who have suspected um, whole, whole gut or, or uh, partial dysmotilities as, as uh, well as in patients with constipation. And from that point on, we've seen a few more papers which have come out. Um, this one, which is uh, 2019, I, I think is one that, that, that helps me frame how I use this clinically. Um, this, this was done at 10 different centers, and they looked at a wireless motility capsule with scintigraphy. And what they found is that essentially in patients with gastroparesis clinically, um, that the yield was higher with smart pill than with scintigraphy slightly. Um, but the important take home was that 62% uh, of patients with gastroparesis actually had dysmotility in other areas as well too. And so this clinically, I, I think does factor in because if you're seeing a patient who has gastroparesis and you find that they've, they've got dysmotility elsewhere, that may guide your um, choice of medications and perhaps improving dysmotility in the colon may improve symptoms which are proximal. So, you know, where are we as of um, January of this year? And I'll get to why that's changed. But if you look at the pros and cons of this, um, the, the pros are that we have reasonable agreement between smart pill and scintigraphy. Um, you can give this without um, any x-ray exposure. There's nothing in that's nuclear. It's non-invasive. It uh, gives information upon motility throughout the entire gut. And you can get some information with regards to at least the presence of the uh, phase three of the MMC, though not propagation. The cons of this are that it's uh, quite expensive. Um, at least in uh, the US, we have um, reimbursement issues which have limited use. Um, the ability to predict prognosis is unclear with this information. Now, that's true of most tests looking at gastric emptying as well, and so it's not unique. Um, and um, also the ability to uh, look at outcomes also is unclear with this. And while we do get a lot of information about pressure um, from this capsule, um, it really hasn't been leveraged within a way that, that to date has, has been that clinically helpful. Now, there's been some recent updates within the last four months with this. Uh, you may ask why I'm showing you a picture of a beetle. 
And it, um, it stems from, from this notice that, that came out this February, which is that uh, bits of uh, beetle parts were apparently found inside the smart pill, the um, smart bar, and the smart bar was was pulled in uh, February from the market. Now, um, how this was identified, I'm sure, is a great story that is not being being told. But um, right now, you you can't get smart bars based on this. Um, and then we unfortunately just received this notice that uh, that um, actually Medtronic has has made the difficult choice to uh, discontinue the smart pill. And um, what they've said essentially is that some of the, the, the parts which are used to uh, make it have been affected from the pandemic. They have a difficult time getting it. And so they will not be selling it once uh, current supply runs out, which is expected to be this September. So whether this will resurface with another company down the road is unclear. Um, it, it does have a niche function now. Um, that that we, we we don't have a clear uh, replacement for at at least in what's FDA cleared. Um, I'll I'll do one slide just looking very quickly at video capsule endoscopy and this was FDA approved in two thousand one. Um, it's more commonly per performed and and if you take a look at the U S alone uh, per year there's about fifty thousand thousand of these done um, and this is utilized looking at bleeding inflammatory bowel. Uh, uh, plus also looking at celiac. Um, it's not a good study looking at gastric emptying per se because you um, tend to take it when fasting and so you don't have a meal trigger. And it doesn't have a battery span that would, la that would last enough to look at the whole gut. Uh, but there has been some interesting work from Spain where they've taken the contractions and images and they've tried to look at the small bowel motility with it. Now, um, this as far as I know is uh, still um, just investigational, but given that we don't have smart pill and given that this is something available, we might see more of this in the future. So what's new on the horizon? There's really two things which I want to end with. The first one is the motility gas capsule and then second is the intestinal sampling device. And if we um, look at the gas capsule which is made by, um, by um, Atmo uh, uh, who um, actually is one of the sponsors of this, this course. Uh, this is new. It's in clinical trials now. It's not FDA cleared yet. It's approximately the same size as, um, as what um, we, we saw with both smart pill as well as the video capsule endoscopy. And it looks at temperature, and then it looks at the concentration of both hydrogen as well as CO2. And then they, they can look at also volatile um, 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 compounds, uh, plus also a, a, a marker of anaerobic function as well. And what this allows you to do is look at segmental and whole gut tran trans at time, but then there's extra information that's derived regarding the gas production as well. There's one pa pa paper that came out about nine months ago that compared this system with, with um, smart pill, looking at just transit. And what they found is that in uh, 50 uh, patients that got both of these back to back, that uh, the uh, computed tran transit time was very, 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 um, very uh, reliable with the two of them. And so the agreement was 97% between the two capsules. And on average, the median time for each segment was about six minutes apart or less. So it, it does appear from a transit time to look to um, look equivalent towards smart pill. And what it's looking at specifically is um, once it exits the stomach, you have a, a change within um, the uh, capsule configuration. There's a change also in the CO2 um, uh, uh, that's there, and and that's the factor that that tells you it's exited the stomach, and then once it enters the cecum, there's essentially a volatile compound change, and that's the marker at that point of cecal entry. And this is a, a, a relatively busy slide, but what you're seeing here is that on the top, the red line corresponds with what you'd see with smart pill, and every other line that you see at this point is, is uh, some information from the Atmo capsule. And the, the blue line, which you, you, you can see going up sharply, that corresponds with the CO2. The drop of that links with the um, entry in duodenum. And then the change in a volatile structure, which is this one, corresponds with, with the entry in colon. So 
it, it appears that if we take a look at where we are now, um, there, there are clinical trials as well looking at this, looking at small intestinal bacteria overgrowth with the idea that you are getting a marker of um, H2, CO2, as well as volatile chemicals. Um, it's not yet FDA cleared, so it's still um, in, in, in um, trials at present. There's been no safety concerns to, to date so far. Um, and if you look at this as to, to where it stands now, it looks like the transit um, that we get in, in terms of the information is very similar to SmartPill. And so while SmartPill gave extra pressure information as well, there was always a bit of head scratching knowing what to do with that information. And where the niche of SmartPill really was at, at this point was more looking at um, you know, the movement and, and um, emptying time itself, which it looks like this capsule gives us. Um, but the extra information with regards towards gas production is really a bonus. And right now, I think it's too soon to say where, where that'll um, um, fall, fall out and if that impacts clinical care. Um, but it, it, it's hard to think that, that there won't be some information there which becomes clinically helpful. And, and I think the long-term hope from the company is that this may be a test to um, look at small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or possibly to look at um, changes within bacterial function based upon dietary change. So I, I'll, I'll end in the um, last minute or two just with the intestinal sampling device. And this is hot off the press. This was published uh, last week in Nature. And what... Um, um, this system does is it's a single-use capsule device that has a uh, bladder that is collapsed inside. And as the shell of the capsule essentially dissolves, which it's triggered to do based on pH and time, this bladder expands and then it sucks contents into it. And then uh, the bladder itself falls, falls out, out. And then you can collect that from the stool and then break down and look at what's in it. And what it allows you to do is to get um, luminal contents from the small bowel and large bowel um, which is separate from the, the stool and from uh, what's reachable with the endoscope. And why um, this was in nature is that if you look and break down the, the types of flora that's identified with this, it's completely different from what we're seeing in the stool. And so given that the, the current thought is that most of the... Um, the real um, gut microbiome function is probably most active within the small bowel and, and not, not the distal colon. Um, you know, it, it seems that the implications for this within uh, both health as well as uh, symptomatic disease states um, seem pretty significant. Now, this is novel. We don't know what's normal. We don't know where this will go in terms of therapy. Um, but, but it's hard to think that we, we won't be seeing this more for um, not just um, gastroparesis patients, but you know, pretty much across the board, board from the GI world. So to, to end here, you know, we are in a time of challenges plus excitement with this technology. Um, since 2006, our main capsule has been SmartPill, which is validated with transit, gives info about pressure, but you know, we don't really have a great idea of what to do with that information. But uh, bottom line is that it looks like this will, will not be a, be a uh, long-term clinical option unless some other company buys it. Um, but we're in the dawn of a new age at this point with these devices, and it seems that uh, the Atmo gas, gas capsule system um, really couldn't have been luckier in the way that they got this developed because I think their plan really was to, to go after the small intestinal bacterial market, but um, with smart pill ending, um, it, it really gives them a niche to step into. So I, I think this is something that we'll see a lot more. And then the CAP scan system or the intestinal sampling device um, is really a, a big black box at, at, at this point. You know, I think we, we don't know where this will take us, but just given the fact that this last week was in nature, it's hard to think that we, we won't be seeing this a lot more, more in months and years to come. So um, thanks very much, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, John, for a really uh, smooth run through these uh, non-digestible capsules. It's uh, inter always interesting to hear an American perspective on these things. Um, do we have any questions? John, that was superb. Oh, thank um, you. Just 
you know, it's a capsule, right? It's not a digestible meal. I, right, yeah. right. So intuitively, if you say, how representative is it of, of gastric emptying? I'm sure you have the yeah. same question. Yeah, yeah. No, we 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 um, scratch our head with that, you know. And it's not uncommon that we see patients who are very slow in smart pill, and their you know solid scintigraphy looks completely normal. Um, I I think it's almost like a manometry and endoflip, where they're 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 both processes which are part of physiology, but they're different and they're not measuring the same thing. So, um, you know, completely agree. And, and I, you know, I think that the, the, the fact that you only see these capsules empty with the MMC in about 60% of the capsules also, I think, illustrates the fact that, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to, you know, know what to do with this information. Where, where I find it most helpful in my own practice is just more looking at those patients who have uh, symptoms that I think are localized towards one area and looking if there's more of a whole gut uh, dysmotility that's present. But uh, your, your uh, point is well taken. Fantastic. In which case, we'll move on. So while Mark is getting the slides, I'm pleased to introduce the next speaker, Guillaume Gozerol from Rouillon, talking about endoflip in gastroparesis. So, so weird. Definitely have to switch off this computer and switch it back on again. There we go. <laughs> So Guillaume, Guillaume's really been a, a very innovative leader using this new technology. And, oh dear, sorry, I'm going to have to, I know what happens here. Start again. Yeah. I have to move it in here. <laughs> this wasn't happening the first two days, but... I can handle it. <laughs> okay. You're doing well, Mark. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to talk about uh, endoflip in gastroparesis. Here are my disclosures. And uh, endoflip uh, and gastroparesis is uh, a very nice story, and this is probably how the story started, uh, by measuring the pyloric activity. It's a study uh, coming from the Mayo Clinic uh, using a specific homemade perfused uh, catheter uh, with uh, four uh, channels uh, located at the pylorus level, and uh, the authors um, measured the pyloric uh, pressure in uh, diabetic patients with nausea and vomiting and very likely to be gastroparesis. And what they found uh, is that uh, very specific motility pattern that is um, shown uh, with a star uh, with an increased tone of the pylorus with surimposed uh, contractile phasic activity and they name it uh, pyloric spasm or pylorospasm. And uh, from that study, let's move to the end of the story, recently was published a randomized controlled trial evaluating uh, the efficacy of uh, pyloromyotomy, um, namely GPOM, in gastroparesis. And this trial was positive uh, with a superiority of uh, pyloromyotomy uh, over the sham procedure. And we could say that the story ends well, and we have to target the pylorus to treat uh, almost every uh, gastroparietic patient. But, um, but the, the story is not as simple as this, and I don't believe uh, we are facing a real romance between the pylorus and the gastroparesis, and there were some complications. And in the meantime, uh, two randomized controlled trials show uh, that uh, intra-pyloric uh, <coughs> injection of uh, botulinum toxin has no superiority over placebo in gastroparesis. Moreover, uh, there is a French study uh, that randomized by gastroparietic patients uh, between uh, GPOM and uh, Botox, uh, which was supposed not to have any efficacy. And uh, the trial was negative with a comparable efficacy of both techniques. <coughs> 
And then when you look at the efficacy uh, of GPOM over the time, the very first randomized control trial I'll show you uh, showed the efficacy at three months. But when you look at the efficacy over uh, 24, uh, 36 months, or even uh, beyond four years, um, we have uh, the feeling that the efficacy of GPOM is decreasing over time. So basically, um, it's really difficult to state that we have to target the pylorus in every patient, and this is why we need a tool to predict what, what patient is going to uh, the GPOM procedure and which patient is going to another procedure. So this is how we came to um, the insertion of the endoflip uh, catheter into the pylorus. Um, you probably uh, are all familiar with uh, the endoflip um, catheter. This is basically um, composed of um, a series of impedance sensors. Of impedance sensors that can determine oh, the volume. Sorry, the impedance sensors that determines um, the, the, the liquid fluid um, or, um, around the, the sensor, and then uh, it could uh, measure the, the diameter of, of, of the balloon filled with uh, uh, the, the, the solution. And there is also a pressure um, sensor, and then you can measure the diameter the volume, let's say the volume and uh, the pressure, and then you can obtain the distensibility or the compliance of the sphincter. And in this panel is shown a representative uh, recording of endoflip uh, with um, the, the pyloric sphincter narrowing the balloon of uh, the endoflip probe. You can insert the probe um, using two ways. The, uh, Probably most popular way is to insert the balloon through endoscopy. Um, you have an example here. And uh, also in our um, hospital, we um, are familiar with the insertion of the probe using a video fluoroscopic um, uh, tool, um, which um, allows to uh, not to have uh, sedation in patients. And so when we did the very first study uh, regarding the um, endoflip in the pylorus, we studied three population. The first was a population of healthy volunteers. The second population was, of course, a population of patients with gastroparesis. And the last subset of patients were patients with esophagectomy for cancer reasons. Uh, in most patients. Why esophagectomy? Because when you are doing esophagectomy, you are doing a vagotomy. And if you are doing a vagotomy, uh, then you are very likely to get a pylorospasm. And now the, all the esophagectomy are performed through uh, laparoscopy. And during laparoscopy, the surgeon don't do any pyloric dilation uh, anymore for technical issues. And so that was a kind of model of um, kind of positive control, a model of pylorospasm. And what we found is that uh, the pyloric pressure was quite similar among the three groups, at least didn't um, distinguish among the, the, the three groups. But when we looked at the pyloric compliance, or I said, let's say, distensibility, we found that patients with uh, gastroparesis had decreased <coughs> Uh, pyloric distensibility compared to healthy volunteers. And the group that has the lowest distensibility was, of course, the group of esophagectomy. When we looked uh, uh, whether there was a correlation between the endoflip measurement uh, and uh, gastric emptying, uh, we found in our study that patients with impaired distensibility uh, had um, delayed gastric emptying compared to patients with normal um, distensibility. And this uh, data was um, reproduced by another study from um, Los Angeles, California, by SNAP and collaborators, 
who found that uh, the end of flip uh, measurement, at least the, the end of flip uh, distance sensibility and the diameter of the pylorus, uh, was, uh, were both decreased in patients with the most severe delay in gastric emptying. But I have to acknowledge that a third study didn't find any correlation between the both, me uh, the both measurements. So it's not perfectly correlated to gastric emptying, let's say. Is it correlated to symptoms? That was probably the, the, the major point. And the answer is that the correlation with symptoms is very poor. I took uh, as an example nausea, which is a cardinal symptoms of gastroparesis. In our study in Rouen, we found uh, a correlation between nausea and distensibility, but the correlation uh, was really weak. And another study uh, performed at uh, Temple University in Philadelphia <laughs> didn't found any correlation between nausea and distensibility. They found uh, other correlation with early society and fullness, but again, the correlation were very weak. The point is that correlation between symptom and gastric emptying itself is very weak. And I showed another example here, the correlation uh, we had between gastric emptying and nausea in our cohort in Rouen. And you will see that the correlation is also very weak with gastric emptying. So on the flip, uh, I would say do as well as gastric emptying to correlate with symptoms. So uh, is there any threshold um, to, 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 to obtain from these uh, procedures? We, uh, f when we performed that study in, in Rouen, we took the uh, 19th percentile of LC volunteers to try to determine the threshold um, to which we could say that uh, this is disturbed or this is normal. And using that threshold, we uh, attempted to measure um, if there was altered distensibility among the different uh, patient population. Um, what we found is approx approximately one third to half of the patient with idiopathic or diabetic <coughs> gastroparesis had uh, altered pyloric uh, measurement using those threshold. And probably the two populations that have the highest uh, abnormalities are the patient with the post-surgical gastroparesis, very likely uh, post fund duplicature, and the patient with the esophagectomy, namely the lewis anti procedures. Very interestingly, we investigated patients with sleeve gastrectomy with symptoms evocative of gastroparesis, and a very, very few of them had um, altered pyloric um, um, parameters. And often in the gastroenterologist's mind, uh, the surgeon um, lesions the vagus nerve during the sleeve uh, gastrectomy, and this is actually not the case. The vagus nerve is preserved during uh, such procedure, and this is probably one way um, to uh, assess the normal physiology of the pylorus in sleeve gastrectomy since uh, the gastric emptying measure is not valid in that very specific population that has a modified stomach. So um, uh, pyloric distensibility may be useful in that very specific population of, sli of sleeve gastrectomy. <laughs> So does now the pyloric distensibility correlates with diabetic parameters and especially the neuropathy? Um, in our cohort in Rouen, the answer is no. Uh, the different measurements do not correlate uh, with uh, HB1C, with retinopathy. This is borderline with nephropathy, but it does not correlate with neuropathy. And we had only six patients under GLP-1 uh, agonist, so it's difficult to conclude uh, for that specific subset of patients. So finally, the question is, is pyloric and a predictive tool? Um, the very first uh, assessment that we can make is that um, when uh, you are doing a, um, something on the pylorus with dilation, uh, botulinum toxin or GPOM, in every publication I've seen, there is a modification of the uh, end of flip parameters with a decrease in pressure and um, an increase in distensibility. So um, I think this is quite uh, consensual that um, <coughs> acting on the pylorus modifies the, the, the pyloric physiology. <coughs> 
but then do uh, uh, pyloric end of lip uh, accurately predict uh, the clinical outcome. This is the first study we did with uh, Charlotte Desprez, who is in, in the audience. And we compared a population of patients with decreased pyloric distensibility and we measured uh, the symptoms before and after um, the injection of botulinum toxin in the pylorus. And in that population, we observed the decrease in the main symptoms of gastroparesis, nausea, vomiting, and fullness. And when we looked at patients with normal pyloric distensibility, we didn't observe anymore uh, the change in symptoms three months after the injection of uh, botulinum toxin. So this uh, very first uh, data indicated that maybe uh, pyloric on the flip could serve as a predictive tool. Uh, we did more or less the same study with Jeremy Jacques, who is an endoscopist who performs uh, GPOM in France. And we could determine that uh, the distensibility uh, using the threshold that I show you had a good uh, specificity and sensibility to predict a good outcome in patients undergoing GPOM. And then there were further studies uh, evaluating uh, the, the, the ability of uh, pyloric endoflip to predict uh, the outcome after GPOM. And this study, the, the two other studies show that uh, diameter of the pylorus could predict the outcome of GPOM. However, I have again to acknowledge that these findings have not been shown in all studies and uh, whether uh, endoflip can uh, accurately and repeatedly um, predict the outcome is uh, uh, not, um, um, is quite controversial, let's say. So can we do better? <laughs> well, the first step to do better is to have normal values and to have valid normal values. Here are the three studies that uh, investigated the normal values. Um, the one uh, from our group in Europe, there is also one study in India and another one, another one in US. And as you can see, the population um, that were uh, recruited for the normal value are quite, quite different uh, from one study to the other in terms of age, in terms of BMI, and also and, and, and mostly in terms of protocol because uh, some normal values were, um, uh, real, uh, were performed in unsedated patients and under sedation, um, which may modify the pyloric physiology. And does uh, the sedation modifies uh, the pyloric um, parameters? Uh, the answer is yes. Charlotte Desprez um, computed uh, all the endoflip, uh, the pyloric endoflip performed in France uh, last year, uh, 135 patients. And uh, she could show that uh, sedation itself could modify uh, the pyloric parameters. She could show also that uh, Curar could modify the pyloric um, pressure. And of course, the sympathomimetics could also modify the pyloric pressure. And if I can show you those data, um, this is because uh, the anesthesiologist uh, sometimes use curar, sometimes not. Sometimes use sympathomimetics, sometimes not. And it is really difficult to interpret the data using different sedation protocols. So probably we have to, to improve um, and, and, and probably to establish a common protocol to, to, to share our data. The last uh, possibility is to use high resolution manometry. Um, in our very first study, we showed that pyloric pressure using high resolution manometry couldn't distinguish between healthy volunteers and gastroparotic patients. And this has been replicated by the group of SNAPE and collaborators. But we recently reviewed um, our traces in light of the famous pylorospasm as defined uh, in the 80s. And uh, the paper is under submission. But what we could show is that that pylorospasm is probably more frequent in patients with gastroparesis than in patients with normal gastric emptying. Maybe it's another tool that we have to assess. So in conclusion, endoflip measurements um, can be easily used in routine care, uh, correlate with gastric emptying in most studies, but not all, and are definitely modified by uh, pyloric targeting therapies. However, uh, 
However, a pyloric endophlip is poorly correlated with symptoms, as gastric emptying, and is an unconstant predictor of therapeutic response. So at, at the moment, there are needs. The needs are uh, to establish normal values under different conditions, and in particular, sedation protocol. And uh, probably, we need also to develop other tools to better predict the outcome of, of our patients. But at the moment, uh, I believe that endoflip is probably the only tool that we have available to measure pyloric uh, physiology. And endoflip is far to be perfect. And it's probably the worst technique to measure pyloric physiology, but I anticipate this is at the exclusion of all the others. <laughs> like democracy. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic, Guillaume. And um, but we have lots of questions. Excellent. Cool. 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 Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, two uh, quick questions. When you're looking at a distensibility um, C, SA, and pressure, do you look at both 40 and 50 or uh, just focus upon one? one? Yes. I didn't want to... Uh, to show you all the data we have at 40, 50. Uh, the very first study was at 40 uh, because the ethical committee, uh, at least in France, uh, didn't allow us to go up to 50. But all the, um, the subsequent study use most of them uh, 50. And uh, at least in our groups, uh, all the data at 40 correlates very well at 50. And the negative findings we have at 40 are negative at 50. And the positive we have at 40 are positive also at, at 50. It's just a matter of, of threshold. And um, the, the threshold we identified in the very first paper at around 10 um, millimeters square uh, was obtained at 40. And the one from Jeremy Jacques with the GPOM was obtained uh, at 50, for instance. And uh, do, you, do, you, do you have a uh, flip uh, Fine finding that will keep you from uh, doing a GE poem. If you're looking, let's say you you've got a CSA of 250, do you do you stop at that point, or is it really at this point just getting the information to see what helps? Not at the moment, but I the worst results were um, during during uh, endoscopy were uh, were obtained if it's over. Let's say 15, 20, I, I, I anticipate that we will get a bad result, but it's not automatic, and, and I think we have to progress in terms of thresholds. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I do, if it's more than, if it's in my practice more than about 10 or 12, and if the gastric emptying is normal, then I don't send them for GPOM. Yuk Jung from Asan Medical Center, Seoul, Korea, and uh, there is one paper regarding the, you know, the S Vegas is a little bit straight, however, Duodenum and the pylorus is a little bit banded, so that the location of the balloon can cause the, the overdiagnosis of the pylorus spasm. So how can you measure the, the, the ideal position of the, the balloon during the measuring the, your pylorus spasm and in the flip of the gastroparesis patient? This is true. Um, in fact, um, I much prefer the eight centimeters balloon instead of the 16 centimeters balloon, so I would advise to use this one. And the first, if the, the, the curvature of the probe um, had some, um, was an, an important issue, you would see automatically first the pressure rise and eventually the diameter um, that, that falls, and this is we barely see that during the placement, the pressure that rises and, and, and the, the diameter at the end of the tip that, that uh, drops. But again, there is no way to measure it um, more accurately than what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm not sure this is a huge issue. But this, this, it might be an issue uh, anyway. No way to measure it. Well, well I mean, if you're doing endoscopy, <coughs> hmm? Hmm? And, you, and, if it, and if you've got a double bump for you, then you, then you straight you straighten it, and usually it's not a big issue. But you never know what's behind, because you, you never know, you can't look at what's happening behind. 
Do you have an estimate of the, the uh, uh, percentage of pyloraspasm or pyloric malfunction in the, the whole spectrum of gastroparesis? Would you do a G point for all of those patients that you find pyloric uh, problems? Or would you do it as you know, just an opening uh, and access for all the uh, gastroparetic or slow uh, gastric emptying or delayed gastric emptying as a whole? We have now more than hundreds of, of recording. And in our very first study, we showed that, at least with our values, one third of the gastroparetic patients had altered pyloric distensibility. And uh, we continue the, the, the database, and I would say be, it's between one third and one half of patients that have altered pyloric uh, distensibility using our data. And in our center, no, we are not doing GPOM in whatever gastroparetic patients, and we try to uh, not to do that. Although it's an effective technique, but it has also, uh, uh, also inconvenience. Yum, that was superb. Two observations. One is you showed that initial paper from, from, from Mayo, right? And I think what they were referring to, who Anmal Ajlan and Michael Kamleri were referring to, as you know, is the increase in tone, right, which they described as the pylorospasm, right? And superimposed on that, you have those phasic pressure fluctuations. But that increase in tone through pylorospasm, just based on reviewing a lots of gastrodenal monometries, is extremely uncommon, right? So, I mean, it, you know, very uncommon. Okay. And two is that that study which you showed with the high resolution monometry, how, how that one which you said the paper submitted in the, in the bottom right, um, was that the tonic pressure? change the baseline or the superimposed phasic pressure fluctuations? Both. We kept the initial definition from my clinic. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Guillaume. And uh, I think there's a lot of mileage in this uh, approach. Right. So now, to really uh, wake us up with something also extremely novel, here we have Alex Menis from England. Oops, I have to read. It's, 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 it's the kind of the counterfactual <laughs> movement. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Introduce yourself just a little bit. Right, so my name is um, Alex Menes. Some of you might know me, but I'm a bit like Greg, really. I was doing a lot of academic work and then completely failed to get a good academic position, just started a company instead, and now it's got carried away, and that's called Motilant. Um, and then the second I did that, UCL brought me back as an associate professor, showing that I could get money in, so that's academia in a nutshell for non clinicians amongst you. So I've made this talk really about MRI of the stomach. I could talk ad nauseum on the rest of the bowel, but I think in keeping with this session, we're looking at just the stomach today. These are my declarations. Obviously, I'm grossly conflicted by running a company, so let's just get out there, but there's various other bits and bobs. And there's three parts to this talk. So part one is really looking at the fact that gastric MRI has been around for a long time now. The first papers came out in the early 90s, um, but it's never seen meaningful use in large trials, and certainly not in the clinic. The second part of this study is there's lots of interesting studies going on, but I'm going to be a bit controversial and say it's all iterative. There's nothing been particularly exciting or huge that's happened in recent times. And the third part is MRI is quite a nuanced technique. It's not a sledgehammer to kind of solve all your problems. I think you've got to use it quite carefully and in a situational way, and we're going to look at that a bit too. So in the first part of this, my goal is just to reassure you all that MRI can play a pretty good role in looking at the stomach. So first of all, just look at it in all of its glory here. You can see contractions, things swirling around. You know exactly what shape the stomach is, where it's sat in the abdomen, and what it's doing. And I think this is the key strength of the technique, is you can't hide from it. You can definitely see what's going on. And the first question everyone asks is, well, can you look at transit? And I think there's lots of studies on this, and the answer is yes. So Nottingham have done a fairly definitive study that I hope will put an end to people looking at more transit studies. 
looking at the combined MRI and scintigraphy. And yes, secretion plays a role in this complexity there. The intercept isn't probably bang on zero, but it's pretty good. Um, and I'll return to this in a bit. Um, there's quite a nice review of all the studies that are taking place here that's come out of the Allberg group. Um, the second part is accommodation with MRI, and I think we can get ourselves really caught up talking about the nuances of what accommodation is, is it pressure or whatever. But I think there's been some pretty good studies coming back from 2002 um, against Barostat. And just to kind of summarize how we look at it, it's the percentage change in the stomach before a meal and after a meal. And I think here's an example of two stomachs going from 102 centimeters cubed up to 416 after drinking roughly 300 centimeters cubed of water, I believe. So. Is this me? No, no, this is someone else. <laughs> no, this is me. Um, I mean, it's not actually me. I think the MRI. Um, and I think the authors concluded here that, you know, they did a really actually quite elegant study challenging the stomach with Barostat and looking at glucagon and erythromycin. And there was strong evidence that MR imaging is accurate as Barostat in measurement, determining changes in gastric volume, and it yields additional information about gastric outcomes, contractions. Um, that is relatively known now. And there's been some nice work since, I think, Mark, you had a hand in this piece of work. But for looking at accommodation, which may be one of the most impact, important aspects of what stomach's doing, I think MRI is up to the job. And I think the thing that MRI is the, absolutely the best at is looking at how that stomach wall moves. So I think this is some fairly old data now, but this is a image post-processing technique to look at diameter changes in a systematic way throughout the stomach. This is all post-processing, so it's non-invasive. And you, these spatial temporal maps are about the distance and the diameter of the stomach moving, not pressure. But they certainly look a lot like those manometry plots that we're used to. Um, this is pretty definitive. Well, it's not that definitive, but this was looked at concurrently in people with a water perfused catheter in them whilst they were having an MRI scan. And the agreement between manometry and the MRI was relatively high. I think quite an impressive feat to pull off considering the circumstance of the person lying in that scanner with a tube in them. Finally, we've actually got pretty good at looking at MRI of the stomach in mice and rats as well. And I think the interest of here is you can go back and forth across the translational divide and do the same exact measurement in the animal, in the human. If you see something in front of the human, you go back to the animal again. And I think this should be very attractive to drug companies and people looking at mechanistic actions across the two. So that's kind of a quick roundup. And I'm sorry for anyone that I've missed off your papers. I think I'll maybe get back to them in a bit. But there was a lot of work done over the last 30 years in this space. And I think it's, I look, I look at the people that were doing those kind of studies in the 90s and would they be impressed with what we're doing today? And I, I'm, I fear they wouldn't necessarily be that amazed by it. And I'm gonna look at some really cool stuff now, but show you how it's a little bit iterative. So Jens, as Allberg, <laughs> sorry to offend you here, but this is your fantastic rendering of a stomach, looking at you know, how you can reconstruct it from MRI and do these very interesting um, geometric assessments of how the stomach is looking pre and post meal. And I think it looks great, but how is it used? I think the other example is we've really come on quite a long way with looking at contractility. And this is um, from the elementary boys and what they've been doing with their gastric mapping. They've also done some MRI analysis, and this is kind of from their group. And we can see fantastic contractions through the antrum of the stomach here. We can color code the entire stomach volume by how it's contracting, looking at where those contractions are originating. And we can even do this. Uh, deformation mapping now. Now, this is from my paper in 2017. But this um, heat map here, you can see some of it's over the heart with lots of motion and some down the stomach. But the important here is this has now been FDA cleared and C marked. So it's a completely non-invasive test to look at the deform deformability of the stomach. And that's cleared for adults and kids. It's available in every single MRI scanner in Europe and America if you chose to use it. So there's been some nice steps forward, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I'd like to point to UCL here and also the AMC, where they've put in a lot of legwork here, really refining how we actually acquire images. If any of you have had the uh, dubious honor of looking at cardiac MRI, the technicians there are looking at the heart and positioning every single slice in a custom way to that patient to make sure they go bang through the key anatomy. And we're seeing evidence of this kind of protocol now emerging in gastric physiology. Not everyone's stomach is in the same position and layout. Um, and I think planning your MRI in orthogonal angles and making sure you really go through the long axis, the pylorus and other areas to kind of get the best images is a big part of that. And we're seeing advances here, but not nearly enough. And finally, and this has been my pet project, we've now got a web-based platform where everyone can upload their data and regardless of where you are in the world, get access to the same tools, the same measurements 
and start producing these reports that summarize emptying, wall motion, and accommodation in a fairly standardized way. And I don't want to go on about it, but it's these kind of practical steps where people writing bits of computer code somewhere over here, the PhD or then moves lab or changes group, and then all of that data gets left behind on a hard drive somewhere. And we've seen this pattern recurring over the years of people do a bit of work, n equals 10 studies, and then they move site and the data's lost. And I think there's lack of continuity in the literature, what we're measuring and how we hold on to data has been really quite a big problem for how we've been looking at gastric um, MR. So all of this work is important and, it, and you know, it's quite impressive what people have to do just to get these images. And I think most important, anyone that's working imaging just likes to produce these fantastic images of stuff. I mean, I think when you look at you know, how the images look, people are like, wow, that's, that's, that's awesome. But it's not just about making pretty pictures, even though that's where my heart is. Um, there has been limited progress on what was being done 20 to 30 years ago in this space, and that kind of galls me, given you know, what we can see happening. And I think the question is, where do we go next? So I think the final part of this little talk here is we now need actually philosophical advancements in this field, not technical ones. The technology is there. Um, I think we need to start just thinking about how we're actually going to make it work. And like most people, I'm just going to go back to cardiology here and look at this. So this is a 24-hour ECG. And this is a 4D flow with cardiac MRI. And the simple point I want to make here is you don't confuse the use of these two tests in cardiology. You don't put someone in an MRI scanner and wait 24 hours to see if they happen to have a cardiac event. Similarly, you don't look at this you know, pressure in the aorta via 24-hour ECG. We need to use the right tool for the job. Very simple. I think just to point out this 4D flow with cardiac MRI, it is next to a miracle that they actually got this far with it when you think about how much complexity went into it and yet the cardiologist somehow pushed it through. Now we have these situational tests. The MRI scanner is not a test that should sit there for long exams. If it's short and quick and if you're taking more than 20 minutes in that magnet, you're doing it wrong. And I think again, they've got the cardiac stress test where they give um, you know, adenosine stress testing to get the result quickly and come and look for the key event. And I think we need to take this false suite down to the stomach and get on with it. Now, we get caught up on ourselves quite a lot, I find. Um, I, when I started doing this work back in circa 2015, I thought, well, I'm going to just stick water in them because it'll go down quickly, it'll sit there, and it'll go back out again fast. And I think, to that extent, it worked pretty well. The water stress test provides a lot of volume change, and it provides a lot of contractile activity. But I've got like a remarkable amount of pushback at peer review and elsewhere about how it didn't have vo volume, didn't have calories, there was no fat. There was like lots of problems with it, and I think everyone just kind of moved on. And I feel like the whole gastric community has been caught up in this gastric emptying question. I've tried to put this into a bit of a meme template here, where the MRI can look at accommodation, motility, loads of different things, you know, fantastic stuff. But we seem to take this hard swerve off towards gastric emptying con constantly. And whenever you start thinking about gastric emptying in the MRI scanner, you've got to suddenly lock that person in the scanner for about three plus hours. You've got to get them in and off the table. And that's where you start seeing huge pushback from everyone around scanner usage. In America, the MRI scanner is a money maker. You know, it brings revenue to that hospital. They want to do spines, they want to do knees, they want to do brains, they want to do prostates. They want to get these things done as a big top line to the hospital. In the UK, with the NHS, it's about speed and getting in and out quickly. You don't want to have someone coming back and forth to your MRI scanner taking three hours. It's not going to work. In Switzerland, Mark, I don't know what the situation is here. <laughs> Maybe. And we do have advantages, <laughs> but it still would be a logistical and political hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's hard work. And I think all the time we're getting drawn into this gastric emptying debate, I think we're getting it wrong. And I think it's probably better to start thinking about taking it off the table. So I'd like to now go to two interesting studies that I've discovered recently. Um, the first one is this fantastic work from Mayo looking at the um, effect of endoscopic sleeve on gastrophysiology. And I believe Abdil is kicking around here somewhere, but this is, represents a real crystal clear usage of gastric MRI to look at a specific mechanistic component of something going on in the gastric sleeve procedure. So first of all, the gastric emptying was looked at with breath testing. You know, this is a relatively available and relatively cheap test, and that took care of what's the emptying time. And then simply the motility and the accommodation was measured with MRI in what, you know, what looked like to me in the paper, at least, a relatively short MRI exam time of probably about 30 minutes. And I think the, the outcome here was sleeve gastrectomy preserves stomach contractile contractility while delayed gastric emptying and produced favorable change in satiety, and, um, satiety hormones. 
Now, the key thing here is they've picked the best part of the MRI and did a very specific protocol around just looking at that. And I think this is something that could fly in a lot of different clinics. And I think it's, it's an elegant piece of work. And it only saddens me a little bit that the MRI bit was smuggled into the methods down below in what's otherwise a very, well, what is a very high impact paper at a very important time and how we're looking at obesity. The second part, and I don't want to steal this um, from Asbjorn and the Ulberg group that are presenting this, but the other big part is going back to our favorite cohort, which is diabetics. I think everyone knows what they're dealing with with a diabetic. And they use MRI to look at gastric physiology here, but in big numbers, 46 um, disease patients and 40 healthy volunteers. And I think they will tell you about just how many hours they used up in that MRI scanner. And I think only in probably Denmark can they get away with using this gratuitous amount of MRI scan time to look at emptying and everything. But interestingly, they didn't find much going on in gastric emptying. All the action was further down in the small bowel, which is, of course, in the field of view. And I think what's really quite good about the, um, you know, the MRI scanner. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this. You can go and look at it and hear about it from the horse's mouth, as it were, um, on Friday morning. But fantastic work, and I think speaks to the strength of looking at the MRI scanner and also the ability for one center to bring a lot of resource to you know, a single place. So conclusions. The state of the art, which is what I was told to talk about, has not really changed in 20 years. And someone could have been here 20 years ago and probably given a very similar lecture. However, all the tools that we need are here now. There is more money than ever before. There is money everywhere. You know, it's, the healthcare is awash with money. It's difficult to get sometimes, but it's definitely there. And there's more scanners than ever. I think there's 14,000 MRI scanners per population in the US at the moment. And I think they're not as expensive as they used to be. About 500,000 euros now buys you an MRI scanner. So there's really no excuses. I know there are excuses, and you can ask me about those in a second. But this is the time to kind of start progressing this field. And I think we need to get on with it. Um, You know, really focused here on the stomach, but there's, you know, a lot of the major advances in MRI have been actually in the small bowel, driven by inflammatory bowel disease, looking at fibrosis and stricturing physiology and all these other things. So you know, there's, there's a lot of reimbursement for, for the Americans amongst us. You know, the abdominal MRI doesn't actually say anything about Crohn's disease. It talks about the body part. So you probably can get it reimbursed if you're able to negotiate. And I think the, if we can keep it to a nice short scan that fits into clinical workflows, it's really not that difficult. And going back to University College Hospital, they have a 20 minute MR physiology exam and they do about 300 of those a year currently just to look at what's going on because it does better than endoscopy when it comes to looking at difficult patients that are not too much of a high concern for cancer. So relatively short talk, that gives you a bit of a, an overview here. Um, that's my email address. I'd like to say thanks to all the collaborators and sorry for any missed references. I couldn't, there was 2,000 papers published on gastric MR that's taken place over the last 30 years, so quite a literature to go through. I'd like to thank you, Mark, for getting me along and the, all of you folks for listening. Cheers. Thank you, Alex, for coming. Thank you. I do think it will be a challenge to get completely beyond gastric emptying, but I am, I do think that one could drastically shorten it to, because the really interesting stuff that happens is often very early on. Mm. Mm. Any questions for our imaging experts? You've, they're all looking forward to the chocolate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, do you have any questions? Yes, I, I, I sort of would like to throw it back to you. So what, what's your, wh wh what are you going to do next? <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've very much got, my, my main job is in inflammatory bowel disease, and that's where I work a lot of my time now. And I think this is my passion project, is the physiology of the rest of the guard. Um, companies like Takeda are getting back into the game now with uh, cyclic vomiting and nausea drugs. There's a general interest in gastric function and with anti-obesity drugs, that there's more question than ever about what the, the stump's going on. And so in terms of, but just I'm sort of intrigued, you know, Mark alluded to that in terms of studying gastric emptying, because yeah. I guess there is a role for that. So how would you, how would you approach that? Well, I'm getting to that bit. Okay, sorry. What I've learned from IBD is where there's pharma companies, there's money, lots and lots and lots of money. And I think the next big thing we need to do is start to think strategically about how we get access to some big chunks of money. Because what we need is hundreds, if not thousands, of these scans to look at and assess these aspects, rather than relatively provincial N equals 20 studies that seem to kind of be the dominant thing that's in the literature at the moment. So the, the plan is to find a way to bring people together to write big, compelling grants for big chunks of money, either from the NIH 
Horizon and other groups, and I think we've had partial success of that in the past. But what we need is proper numbers, and we need to point to how this can either help with drug development, which is one of the major catalysts, but obviously the same problem we're all in the boat with is how does this actually impact patient management? And that is a TBC, I think, at this time, but certainly not that far off. But without a clear idea of diagnosis, we're never going to get to a better <laughs> management. And I think in the world where we've got a lot of bariatric surgery, which is an amazing physiological surgical experiment of, and, and Ozempic, I think, I think, I hope that uh, that call to action will be heard. Alex, thank you very much indeed. Um, to the rest of you, thank you very much for uh, uh, hearing out this uh, extraordinary session. And there will be some light relief quite soon at uh, six o'clock. Um, Christine and friends will be back.